It's the fuzzy white lint that launched an industrial revolution and sparked a civil war. When spun and woven, it clothes the human race. Its wondrous fibers and seeds make up everything from greenbacks to blue jeans to lunch. The only commodity to earn the title king. Now, Cotton on Modern Marvels. In late October, the cotton fields of California's San Joaquin Valley are bursting with white gold. It's harvest time. The ancient ritual of picking cotton is about to take place. But this cotton picker is made of steel. This is the John Deere 9996 cotton picker, which harvests six rows of cotton at once. Each machine does about 80 acres a day, and we've got three of these machines. So uh, we're doing anywhere from 220 to 240 acres in a day, uh, which is a pretty, pretty good day. Despite its voracious appetite, this eight-ton machine is remarkably nimble. It uses 480 spindles attached to rotating drums to spool off the ripe cotton bowls. The bowls are the fruit of the cotton plant. A ripe bowl bursts open to reveal 500,000 fibers, known as lint, which are tightly attached to the seeds. The rest of the plant is left intact. And the spindle is turning, and it has little barbs on it, like, like a fish hook has. And it's also wet. That's because a moisture column keeps each spindle lubricated. And so when it comes by here, it being wet will attract the lint, and the little hooks will hook it, and it'll wrap that around the spindle. And it goes through a dolfer. The dolfer helps take the, uh, clean the cotton off the spindle. And then it goes through a vacuum. It's got a, a fan system on it that sucks the cotton through the tubes and into the basket. This ingenious design goes back to the very first one-row spindle picker designed in the 1930s. And that one machine replaced somewhere around 50 hand-picking harvesters. Up until about the 1930s or beginning of the 1940s, most of the cotton was picked by hand. It was very difficult work. Modernization has, has really helped out uh, tremendously. <laughs> Bigger and better. Here at the Stoneland Company's cotton farm, the crop is immediately offloaded to another revolutionary machine, known as the Cotton Module Builder. Situated at the edge of the field, the module builder uses 3,000 pounds per square inch of hydraulic pressure to compress loose cotton bolts into dense blocks called modules. Each 20,000 pound module fits neatly into a custom built truck that can go from the field right to the cotton gin. The cotton module builder was significant because it cut down the number of trips that the farmers would make hauling their cotton in small trailers or wagons. It could haul at least twice the volume and weight of cotton from the field to the gin, probably three to four times faster. With its remarkable growing conditions, California has emerged as a powerhouse for U.S. cotton cultivation, second only to Texas. San Joaquin Valley farmers specialize in high-quality varieties of upland and pima cotton that will end up in dress shirts and high-thread count sheets. It is a little bit longer and a little bit stronger than most upland varieties. And the way we accomplish that is we have a much longer growing season. We plant our cotton in March and we harvest in October. And plus all the cotton in California in the San Joaquin Valley is irrigated. So we control our inputs much more so than in a lot of places in the United States. As soon as they've been harvested, these fields will quickly be converted to other crops for the sake of the soil. Cotton rapidly depletes the soil of key nutrients, especially boron. Uh, crop rotation is very important, and we probably average two years of cotton and then a, a year or two of another crop like garlic or onions or wheat, cantaloupe, or uh, processing tomatoes. From soil care to irrigation to pest control, 
Cotton is a high maintenance crop. And the harvest is only the beginning of cotton's long journey. This is a cotton gin. To be specific, the KDW cotton gin in Bakersfield, California. At one end of the gin, freshly picked cotton, still stuck to its seeds and peppered with plant debris, known as trash. At the other end, bales of pure cotton lint, ready for the textile mill. The transformation begins as the giant cotton modules are fed into a disperser, which breaks the cotton up and conveys it to an airstream. The cotton's conveyed by air throughout the entire facility. We do that to keep it from basically knotting up. We have um, about 30 million BTUs of heat we use in this particular facility to start heating the cotton and warming it up into the low to mid 100 degree range, which is enough to allow that fiber to relax. When those fibers start relaxing, it allows us to use gravity cleaners, whereas we're basically shaking the cotton uh, to, to let the, the leaf and materials fall out of it. The cotton is then fed into the gin stand, which performs a simple task that vexed cotton farmers for centuries, separating the cotton lint from the seed quickly and continuously. At the heart of the cotton gin are rotating saw blades, which grab the lint and pull it through a narrow opening. A gin could have anywhere from 90 of these up to 171 of these in each particular gin stand, of which this location has five gin stands. Um, these turn at a rate of speed at about 12 to 1400 RPM. And basically, you'll just see just a small amount of the saw actually sticks through, just enough to be able to grab that fiber and then pull it through. The seeds, too large to pass through the ribs, fall below. The cotton fibers are combed cleaned again and then smoothed into a layer called a bat. A hydraulic press squeezes the cotton lint into 485 pound pails, still the standard unit of cotton after hundreds of years. Meanwhile, the gin has separated the plant trash and cotton seed into two small mountains. Every scrap of these products will be used. This fluffy white commodity is quite simply one of the most useful substances on Earth. You know, everybody uses it, everybody wears it, nobody even thinks about it. But that is where it accumulates its power because there are so many ways in which cotton becomes a part of our life, whether it's something like a t-shirt, jeans and so forth, that when you put all of that together, the aggregated power of cotton comes from its ubiquitous use. Cotton is something that you're born in, almost, your first diapers. I don't think the... Um, um, New mothers will be interested in putting it in any other fabric but cotton. But in every stage, from the morning till night, including the sheets you sleep on, are cotton. An estimate to suggest as many as 20 million cotton producers around the world. And then we have uh, estimated perhaps five to 10,000 textile mills uh, globally as well. And not to mention the retail community that's ultimately selling it. Cotton is grown in about uh, 100 countries uh, and it's processed in about 120 countries around the world. There's about 130 billion pounds of fiber uh, used every year. About 95% of every cotton bale will end up as clothing or home textiles. One of the things that makes cotton unique is it's actually a hollow fiber. So people know that cotton absorbs moisture, and one of the reasons is it has room in the center. It does also have an insulating value from the standpoint of uh, creating an air space within the fiber itself, and so it's warm in the winter and cool in the summer. That's just one of cotton's many talents. One of the things that makes cotton so useful is that anatomically the cotton fibers twist and spiral. That means that they cling together. And because they cling together, they can be formed into very long chains, which ultimately are reduced from fluffy to thread size. These strong cellulose fibers also go into everything from couch stuffings to candle wicks. And through the wonders of modern chemistry, plastics, explosives, even photographic film. And if you ate some potato chips today, chances are they contained oil derived from the cotton seed. But it's cotton's performance as cloth that first got the attention of the human race. It began in the northwest part of India, in the Indus Valley. Tiny pieces of fiber have been found there that indicate that as many as 5,500 years ago, 
cotton was domesticated and actually made into cloth in that area. A second species of cotton was bred in South America. These plants often produced naturally pigmented bowls. And while the Inca are known for their textile mastery, the use of cotton textiles in the Andes actually predates the Inca by 2,000 years. A third species was bred in Central America and a fourth in East Africa. These four are the progenitors of the modern cotton plant. It's a perennial plant. If a, the cold weather didn't come along, cotton would grow into a tree. The world's first cotton industry took root in India. And by the time Alexander the Great arrived in India in 320 BC, cotton had become the predominant fabric. Alexander and his soldiers used Indian cotton to pad their saddles. They called the soft fabric tree wool. Europeans' confusion over cotton's origins continued well into the modern era. Much of the blame for this confusion can be attributed to the imaginative 15th century travel writer, John Mandeville, who wrote in great detail about the dewy sheep that grew on trees. And as these dewy little sheep bent down to eat the grass, they collapsed and fell over, leaving behind the dew, the dewy fluff on the plant. So the vegetable lambs of Scythia, as he called them, he considered to be the source of cotton. And everybody bought this story. And this story kept resurfacing throughout history, even 200, 300 years later. Arabian traders called the cloth from India kutun, meaning fine fabric. The anglicized name became cotton. Cotton itself was nearly non-existent in Europe, which relied on linen, and especially wool, for its clothing. The tide began to turn with Vasco da Gama's 16th century voyages to Calcutta. Vivid Indian textiles, which miraculously retained their deep colors after repeated washing, began to find their way to Europe's upper classes. Suddenly, the wealthy people of Europe, and England in particular, and France, all the wealthy women wanted to have as much of this colorful cotton as possible around. And everything started to change from that moment on. By 1700, the cotton craze had become such a threat to wool growers in England and France that wearing cotton was made a crime punishable in some cases by death. Still, the desire for cotton filtered into the rest of the population. Soon, demand far outpaced supply. England's King George II began to eye the cotton fields of India with envy. Many people wonder why England took over India in the middle of the 18th century. And the answer is pretty simple. India had a huge amount of resources that England wanted, and England was kind of tired of having to pay for them. So what do you do when you don't want to pay for something? You take over the country. That was very true of cotton. It wasn't the only reason by any means that England took over India, overran it, really. Created a false war and then used that as a pretense to take over the country. But it was one of the main reasons. From the 1750s on, England forbade Indian cotton growers from spinning or weaving their own product, forcing them to buy cloth from the new English textile mills. Indian cotton would remain in British hands until the mid-20th century, when Mohandas K. Gandhi urged his countrymen to take the symbolic and very real action of once again spinning their own cotton. But in the late 18th century, that day was a long way off. England had secured itself a bounty of Indian cotton. Soon, it would possess the means to turn it into cloth quickly. England's textile mills and America's cotton gin would jumpstart an industrial revolution and ignite a looming civil war. India's cotton textile tradition has given the English language the words pajama, dungaree, seersucker, calico, madras, and khaki. Cotton will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. Now return to Cotton on Modern Marvels. You're looking at a machine that changed history. Today's high-speed, high-tech cotton gin belies its humble origins. It all began with a breakthrough made in 1793 by an unemployed Yankee tinkerer named Eli Whitney. From the very largest gin to the very smallest gin, the concept's the same. You have ribs, 
which are these here, saw blades, and a slot. And the cotton is grabbed by the saw blade and pulled through the slot. But the seed is too big to go through that slot. These are the brushes turning, and they get the lint off of the back of the saw blades, collect it. They produce a lot of wind that blows the cotton out of the back of the gin. Before Eli Whitney's gin, cotton had been an unprofitable specialty crop in the United States. The problem? It took up to 18 months for a slave to remove the seeds from one bale of cotton. And so no matter how much cotton could be grown, there was no way in the whole supply chain that it could be converted as quickly as necessary through all the various stages to make it into a fabric. Whitney's invention sped up the ginning process by a factor of 50. Ultimately, that winds up being 1,000 to 2,000 times more because of the uh, use of steam engines and so forth. In 1793, the year of Whitney's invention, the South produced 10,000 bales of cotton. By 1835, it was producing 1 million bales a year. Cotton had become king. By mid-century, the once insignificant crop would account for nearly two-thirds of the total value of American exports. Cotton plantations bloomed across the South, especially along the Mississippi Delta. It was flat, had a lot of average waterfall and rain, and rich soils that would, would grow just about anything they wanted to. But the bounty made possible by the cotton gin came at a terrible price. In making cotton economically viable, it also created a huge demand for slave labor to pick the cotton. Slavery was on the way out for a short time in the late 1700s, but along came Whitney's gin, and then all of a sudden, slavery was back in vogue. As cotton began to deplete the soil of the southeastern states, the plantation owners, rather than using crop rotation, moved further west, planted more cotton, and brought in more slaves. Whitney's gin not only made cotton a viable crop, it enabled innovations taking place in England to make textiles a booming industry. The first major innovation was James Hargrave's spinning jenny, which mechanized the ancient art of spinning and twisting fluffy cotton fibers into strong yarn. But it was the tireless entrepreneur Richard Arkwright who perfected Hargrave's spinning machines and incorporated them into the world's first modern factories. When Richard Arkwright, the father of the Industrial Revolution, came along in about 1770, he took the best qualities of Hargrave's spinning jenny, combined them with a few other innovations that were going nowhere, really, and created the first mechanical spinning apparatus called the water frame. It was called the water frame because the rivers of northern England provided the power. These rivers drove a crucial early 19th century innovation, the power loom, which wove cotton yarn into fabric at a pace unthinkable by a hand weaver. When fabric is woven, vertical yarns, called the warp, are intersected by horizontal yarns, called the weft. Harnesses, also called heddles, separate the lines of warp yarn to create a space for the weft to pass through. This is two heddles, two harnesses, which makes a plain weave. When one goes up, the other goes down, and it forms what we call a shed, and it's like a little lean-to. The shed is the area the shuttle will fly through. When the shuttle flies through it, from the bobbin, it leaves what we call a pick. That's one pick. It's all powered by a clutch system with a, with a handle here. When you pull the handle, it engages the clutch, driven by the overhead line shaft and the pulley. We'll turn the crankshaft, which will spin the drive shaft, which has cams on it that'll throw the shuttle from one side to the other. Cotton textiles were the vanguard of the Industrial Revolution. Cotton factories sprouted alongside England's rivers as quickly as cotton plantations along the Mississippi. This revolution turned the sleepy town of Manchester, England, into an industrial giant overnight. And by the way, it becomes one of the great foul cities on Earth because there were no regulations. It also becomes socially reprehensible because kids at the age of six or seven were forced to work in factories. Over 200,000 children in England, almost all of them orphans, were pressed into work in the cotton factories of Manchester. They weren't just sweatshops, they were prisons for kids. 
After touring the cotton mills of Manchester in 1812, a Massachusetts entrepreneur named Francis Cabot Lowell vowed to bring England's technology home, but without the human suffering. Lowell helped found the first great industrial towns of America. Francis Cabot Lowell and the Boston Associates, the Boston aristocrats, built the first factory in Waltham, Massachusetts. Lowell then dies in his early 40s, but his brother-in-law and the rest of the associates build the first real big factory in the United States in Lowell, Massachusetts, because it's next to the Pawtucket Falls. Unlike the enslaved child workers of Manchester, the Yankee farm girls who toiled in Lowell were well cared for by the Boston associates. Their best workers were young women, and in order to get these young women over here by the hundreds and thousands, they had to have an environment that their parents would allow them to work in. The power loom continued to evolve. Pre-programmed pattern chains, like the pegs in a music box, turned out fancier weaves. Automatic bobbin changing devices allowed for ever-increasing speed. We judge loom speed by ticks per minute. These are running about 150 ticks per minute. As loom speeds increased, so did the demand for cotton. But the endless flow of slave-picked cotton into New England's textile mills was becoming too hard to ignore. Northern abolitionists, including many in Lowell, cried out against the unholy alliance between southern cotton planters, the lords of the lash, and the northern textile barons, the lords of the loom. There was so much money on the table that it made no sense for the lords of the loom the industrialists of New England, to try to stop slavery in the South, at least where it existed. And they went through contortions to try to justify that because there were often very religious people who had a moral apprehension about slavery. But at the same time, economically, it made great sense. It was the cooperation of those two forces that kept the Civil War from happening a lot earlier than it did, at least as I reread history. As soon as anti-slavery forces tipped the delicate balance, the nation's bloodiest war began. Since cotton was the southern economy, it played a major role in deciding the war's outcome. One of the mistakes that the South made, and it turned out to be the most devastating mistake in many ways, was that it was absolutely sure because so much of the cotton, two-thirds of the cotton being grown in the South were going to feed the English mills. There was no way, according to the plantation owners, that England could do anything except support the South in the Civil War. And that makes perfect sense economically. But ultimately, the anti-slavery factions of England prevailed over the manufacturing interests. And England refused to support the South in the Civil War by continuing to buy its cotton. And it turned out that it went back to India and bought all the cotton that it needed or got all the cotton it needed from India instead. After the destruction of the Civil War, it would take many decades and some help from a pair of jeans and a T-shirt for cotton to become king again. But first, it would have to defeat its greatest enemy of all. The shocking conditions in England's 19th century textile mills influenced the reformist writings of Charles Dickens, as well as the Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Engels' family owned a textile mill in England. Cotton will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Cotton on Modern Marvels. The Civil War cost King Cotton his crown, but an insect brought him to his knees. The tiny flying insect known as the boll weevil crossed into the U.S. from Mexico in the 1890s. It would destroy some $14 billion worth of cotton in the 20th century. Cotton is a perfect home for a variety of pests. A cotton boll opens up to about 500,000 fibers that grow inside it. The inside of that pod is like a perfect um, Ritz-Carlton Hotel for insects. It's warm and cuddly. They can lay their eggs there, and then when they're ready to hatch, they can crawl out. The wily boll weevil managed to beat every pesticide farmers threw at it. A long time ago, the only way to combat the boll weevil was to use arsenic of lead, and they colored it green, so they called it Paris green. 
they would fill both of these hoppers with the Paris green, and then to get on the back of a mule and they would ride it, or sometimes walk and shake it as they went through the field. And it would get the dust all over the plants early in the morning when there's dew, and it would combat the weevil and kill it, but it didn't work very well. It wouldn't kill all the weevils, but it's all that they had. From the 1920s on, farmers using more sophisticated insecticides would gain the upper hand, only to see the weevil return. The big break came in the 1970s, when scientists discovered how to isolate the weevil's pheromones. Farmers set pheromone traps to lure the weevil population into certain areas of the cotton fields. With the weevils in one spot, spraying became much more effective. The legendary boll weevil was contained, but not until the late 1980s. It took them a century. During that time, we sent a person to the moon. We developed nuclear energy. We did all sorts of things, the automobile. During that entire span of the 20th century, nobody could figure out how to <laughs> wipe out this tiny little bug. The weevil-ravaged economy of the South received a shot in the arm in the early 20th century, when the textile mills of New England began to relocate to Georgia, Alabama, and the Carolinas. One of these mills is Cone Denim's White Oak plant in Greensboro, North Carolina, which has been turning raw cotton into denim since 1905. During that time, the White Oak plant has made enough denim for six billion pairs of jeans. At a modern textile mill, the process of converting cotton to cloth begins as a machine called a top feeder sweeps the cotton from bales and sucks it into a cleaning machine, which opens up the fibers and removes any remaining trash. To make cotton into yarn, you first have to align the fibers in one direction through a process called carding. We're starting out with unoriented fiber, and then this machine surfaces that you see on top here, these working surfaces are coming in contact with the fiber on the cylinder and basically doing the same thing that we used to do hundreds of years ago with these hand tools called hand cards. It's aligning, straightening, and paralleling that fiber into what we call a sliver. And this is the beginning then making a yarn. The sliver is spooled into cans, drawn out and recombined, then pulled into thin strands called roving, which are wound onto bobbins. It's now time for a very high-tech version of the ancient art of spinning yarn. All yarns have one thing in common, no matter what spinning system, and that is that they all have twists. We can do a little demo here with, with our hand here, you see how weak that is. If we think about that as being a yarn, then all we have to do is if we apply just a little bit of twist to that fiber, and if you grip it up here, and let's pull on that, we have a very strong material, you see. At the White Oak plant, about 12,000 spindles twist the roving into yarn on machines called ring spinners. At this point in the process, the roving is in the spinning frame. The roving is being fed down into a set of rollers. If you look at the back roller on the spinning frame, it is turning at a slow rate of speed compared to the front, which is a high rate of speed. What that is doing, those rollers are drafting the cotton fibers out. Then the whirling spindle twists the fibers into yarn, giving them the tensile strength needed to make fabric. The mill also uses a newer technology known as open-end spinning which combines drawing, roving, and spinning into one process. But the hottest thing is air jet vortex spinning. This is air jet spinning. This is the newest form of spinning in the evolution of spinning processes. We have sliver being fed in the back, drafting rolls, instead of a whirling bobbin, putting twist in that strand. Here, we're inserting twist with a vortex of air. should the yarn break, a robot places the broken end back into the air jet. After the yarns cascade through the spinning machine, they're wound around another set of bobbins, which are removed automatically and taken to the warp room. 
Here, bobbins of the thick, robust yarn used to form the denim warp are wound onto a large spool. But before it's woven, the yarn gets its trademark indigo blue. The indigo dye needs to oxidize in order to turn blue. So the yarn takes several turns on these skying reels. Then in a process known as slashing, the beams of yarn pass through a starch bath, which prepares the yarn for the rigors of high-speed weaving. Cone Denim boasts one of the largest weave rooms in the world. The area uh, inside our weave room, you can almost put four football fields inside of it. It's over 1,000 feet long. Here, the great spools of indigo yarn are woven so quickly, it's hard to tell that the centuries-old practice hasn't changed all that much. The harnesses still lift the warp yarns up and down, and the weft yarn, now driven by an air jet, still shoots through the opening and is woven in. The picks per minute on the air jets is 778 picks per minute. So in a minute's time, you're going to take the filling across 778 times. The weft yarn is white, providing the cross-hatched, blue-white look that is classic, 100% cotton denim. Blue jeans were introduced in the 1850s as the working man's garment. But in the 20th century, they became the signature garment of America itself. Today, denim is the largest sector of the cotton market and is still an American icon, from the roundup to the red carpet. But the uses of cotton go way beyond clothes. Cotton seed and cellulose feed people, livestock, and industry. Three quarters of paper money is actually composed of cotton. Much of this cotton comes from denim scraps left over from jeans manufacturing. Cotton will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. Now return to Cotton on Modern Marvels. Welcome to Planters Cotton Oil Mill in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. This is where the fuzzy cotton seed is reduced to its basic elements. Meal, oil, and tiny bits of fiber called flinters. These basic elements will rise again in literally thousands of different products. Before there was actually a cottonseed processing plant, uh, the gins would literally throw the cotton seed away. They didn't know what to do, what, do with it. Uh, and so it was more of a byproduct pollution problem than it was anything. Today's cotton oil mills know what to do with it. Seeds represent two-thirds the weight of each cotton bowl. Every year, the planter's company takes in 600,000 tons of cotton seed from cotton gins. And none of it will go to waste. The seeds first work their way through a series of vibrating sieves to remove dirt or plant trash. Then they're fed into a machine known as a delinter, which uses 200 saw blades to remove the linters from the seeds. It's almost identical to the cotton gin in that they have saws that remove the, the, the lint off of the seed. Ours is a little more fine-tuned simply because we're having to really reach down and grab just a few small fragments of lint off of the seed. On a ton of cotton seed, we get about 130 pounds of lint. We make about 90,000 bales of cotton linters per year. Those bales are about 600 pounds each. The mill makes a first cut, which removes the longer fibers. This is our first cut de-linter, and we're taking off 20% of our total lint off our seed. They use this lint in stuffings and couches, SDP oil filters, and fine writing paper. A second cut removes the shorter fibers, still stubbornly clinging to the seed. The second cut goes into a lot of film, more of the refined stuff, electronics and things like that, because it's a lot smaller fiber. The smaller fiber is easier to work with. Cotton linters are valued in such surprising applications because they are nature's purest source of cellulose, the natural polymer that makes up plant cell walls. In film forming applications, cellulose is dissolved in an organic solvent. The cellulose polymer bonds with the solvent to form a strong plastic film. Cotton cellulose has long been used to make cinematic film and celluloid history. In the early 20th century, scientists discovered how to produce nitrocellulose, which proved useful as both a highly explosive weapon of war 
and later as a protective layer and safety glass. Back at the mill, it's time to squeeze every last drop of value from the cotton seeds. Once stripped of the litters, the seeds go through decorticators, where mechanized knives shear the seeds' meat from the hulls. We take those meats from the separation room, and we prep them by adding a little water, running them through uh, some large cookers. And after we cook them, uh, they come out in a pellet-type form over to our extraction plant, where they're, uh, they're washed uh, with a solvent. After the solvent extracts the oil from the meal, the mixture is heated, and the solvent is flashed off. What's left is cottonseed oil. The biggest uh, majority of cottonseed oil is used in the uh, potato chip plants throughout the nation uh, to fry their chips in. It's a very stable, uh, long-life oil because of uh, it does not require hydrogenation, and it's a zero in trans fat, which is the newest thing on the health radar these days. So, uh, you know, cottonseed oil is very popular in, in the snack food industry. The leftover cottonseed meal is very popular with cattle. Cottonseed is very well known for increasing the butter fat in milk, and dairy operators throughout the nation, they receive a premium for that butter fat contents in there. So usually some of your larger dairies, they're feeding about six pounds per head per day of cottonseed. Ironically, not long ago, the chemical industry which cotton cellulose helped to create threatened the Wonder Fiber's dominance in its number one industry, clothing. In the 1960s and through about the middle part of the 1970s, cotton was losing a lot of market share to the synthetic fibers. They came out with some uh, polyesters and other fibers. We were down to maybe 35% of the apparel market from close to 70% in the early 60s. But cotton has gradually regained his throne. And while it was denim that led the charge in cotton's restoration, the epitome of comfort the 100% cotton t-shirt has done more than its share. In Los Angeles, American Apparel has become one of the nation's fastest growing companies on the back of the t-shirt. We're a completely vertical company. The only thing that we require is a good quality spun cotton yarn. We can take that yarn then, we can knit it here, and we can bleach, dye, finish the fabric here. We cut our fabric into pieces, we sew our pieces into garments, and we distribute throughout the world, all out of this facility in downtown Los Angeles. And, and in 2005, that's pretty unique. Unlike denim, which is woven, all the garments here are knit. A modern day machine knits up to 120 ends of cotton yarn into a web of interlocking loops that form the fabric. Fabric assumes a tubular shape as it's wound into rolls. Fans keep stray cotton fibers out of the way. While not as strong as the grid-like structure of a weave, the interlacing loops of a knit are inherently more flexible. Woven goods are much more rigid. Knit goods are built to perform, and they're built to move, and they're built to stretch. That's why most t-shirts are knit. We're putting four plies of tubular fabric into the front end of the machine. The machine then takes over. It's going to pull those four plies into the machine. It's going to align them. It's going to make sure everything is, uh, is balanced within. It'll stamp out the, the, the pieces. So literally here, every 9.2 seconds, we'll get four T-shirts. And of course, the sleeves to go with it. Highly skilled sewing teams stitch on the collars, sleeves, and hem bottoms in 90 seconds flat. Like blue jeans, T-shirts have secured their place in American and global culture by delivering equal doses of comfort and style. Thanks to the success of such timeless garments, the future of cotton is unlimited, especially with a little help from nanotechnology. Cotton linters are used as a binding material in a wide range of products, including paint, lipstick, nail polish, toothpaste, ice cream, and hot dog casings. Cotton will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. We now return to Cotton on Modern Marvels. Cotton is prized for its ability to absorb moisture, making it comfortable and cool. That's also made it less than ideal when the weather turns rough, until now.
This is storm denim. This is our latest development in uh, textile chemistry. It's just like regular denim, except it provides this whole layer of protection. And you can actually see the, uh, what happens here as we spray that garment. You can see the repellency that you would get in a storm. The denim has been waterproofed with a layer of microscopic protective particles. We've got particles here that are about 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers that are applied, and they actually will sit on the surface of the fiber and be bonded to the surface of the fiber. But we can actually do this without altering the breathability of the fabric. We still maintain good vapor transport, and we still maintain the comfort features and all of the normal things that people come to know and love in a, in a denim fabric. But storm denim is only the latest successful use of nanochemistry on cotton. Just as cotton textiles started the Industrial Revolution, stain-resistant and wrinkle-free cotton garments were among the first products to test the waters of the nanotech revolution. We can do all those things to cotton, so it, it stays young. It's a 6,000-year-old fiber, but it stays young and viable. Cotton and technology will continue to get along famously. More problematic is cotton's relationship to the global economy and environment. Although cotton makes up only a small percentage of the world's crops, it uses 25% of the world's insecticides. Cotton genetically engineered to resist pests has greatly reduced the amount of dangerous chemicals sprayed over fields, and organic cotton has made a small dent. But the environmental damage wreaked by cotton cultivation is a long way from resolved. Meanwhile, the cotton economy finds itself once again in a state of rapid change, especially in America. The U.S. used to control the cotton trade from dirt to shirt. Now nearly all textile mills and garment factories have moved overseas, from China to the Caribbean, along with tens of thousands of jobs. But a few companies are bucking the trend and thriving. American Apparel uses a vertical integration model that would make Henry Ford proud. The Los Angeles factory employs 4,000 workers. Downstairs from the cutting and sewing departments are marketing, graphics, and a photo shoot in progress. Even the models are plucked from different departments. By aggressively targeting a young, hip market, American Apparel has seen revenues increase 12-fold in the last five years, all while offering good wages and benefits. We have the highest earning apparel workers in the world. People ask, how can we afford to do this? I ask, how can we afford not to? What is the actual cost of manufacturing offshore? And what do you lose when you don't have product? What do you lose when you don't have quality? What do you lose when you lose customer confidence? Back in North Carolina, where textile mills have become an endangered species, the white oak plant continues to thrive. One of the plant's strategies combines tradition with technology to recreate the blue jeans of a bygone era. Back then, you had yarn that was made with a lot of irregularities. And then worn over a period of time, the indigo would start to abrade off, and you'd see all this yarn character. Well, with the advent of the modern equipment, we made much smoother, more regular yarns, lost that vintage character. Well, today, we're able to recreate it. We have units on our spinning frames that allow us to go back and recreate those vintage-type yarns with this type of character in them that, when woven in the fabric, give the vintage appearance. The design team uses vintage looms and the experience of its employees to recreate the much-coveted vintage look. White Oak has approximately 1,000 employees. Over 40% of them have more than 25 years of seniority. If you look at the total years of experience that this plant has, you're looking at in excess of 15,000 years of experience. You can't just find that anywhere. In the 21st century, no matter where in the world cotton is grown, gin woven and sewn, it will continue to clothe the world. Cotton has woven itself into wars and revolutions and the very fabric of history. It really does make a good yarn. All right, everybody, Abe Lincoln.